My name's Dave Ferrari. Um, I'm MD of uh, Exemplary Energy. We're, a, I guess you'd call us a, a boutique consultancy working in the niche of uh, weather and energy. Uh, most of our business is focused on uh, analysing weather and climate data to help the industry understand its uh, the impacts of weather and climate on the performance of buildings, uh, solar PV and other engineered systems. Um, so in today's presentation we'll be looking at a range of applications of, of weather and climate data um, and our focus is on how these tools can be used to improve energy efficiency outcomes through building control and design optimization. Uh, we'll also touch on some more recent developments around uh, applications of the sort of data that we provide uh, for moisture modelling, which is a growing area of interest under the construction code. Uh, I know there were mandatory requirements introduced in 2019, uh, and it looks like they'll be continuing going forward. Uh, the session will run in three main parts. So we'll be, uh, part one is a uh, discussion around benchmarking and applications of real-time weather data. Uh, the second will be some new developments in work that we've been doing on understanding the extremes uh, of climate and responses of engineered systems to uh, extreme climatic conditions. And the third, as I've touched on there, is uh, applications of precipitation. Um, into in moisture modelling. There'll be time for questions, Q&A and discussion at the end of the session. Uh, so firstly, a bit of background about weather and climate data. Um, if there are any of you who are involved in building design and development uh, and things, uh, processes like demonstration of energy efficiency compliance uh, using the JV3 methodology, or other forms of uh, building energy model. Can I, can I just see a quick raise of hands just to get an idea if, if any of you who are familiar with these sorts of tools, uh, or it's it's relatively new to you? Okay, uh, that's that's good to know. So, um, weather and climate data is used a lot throughout the industry um, by developers, uh, both for residential and commercial buildings of all types. Um, I mentioned their NCC section J, so there are methods that uh, for demonstrating compliance by actually building a, uh, a computer model of the building and then applying the relevant local climate data uh, to evaluate performance and then comparing that model to uh, a model uh, built using the deem to satisfy energy provisions in the uh, National Construction Code. Uh, and if you can demonstrate that your building is uh, more efficient than the deemed to satisfy a building under the relevant climate, then um, uh, then that design is deemed to approve uh, to comply. Um, those applications, both residential and commercial applications of demonstrating energy efficiency compliance, use what we call representative meteorological year or typical meteorological year, uh, and they're they're hourly data sets of a range of uh, climate or weather elements, um, dry bulb, temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, uh, and uh, solar radiation, um, that have been compiled to represent the typical hourly uh, profile of weather for a given location over a period of 8,760 8, hours or 12 months. Um, uh, when we apply that climate data to a building energy model, uh, a, a model of the building physics and the HVAC physics, uh, we can evaluate the impact of that hourly data on the building's energy demand, sorry, the, uh, the building's heating and cooling need, lighting needs, uh, and subsequently through the HVAC model, uh, estimate the, the energy, the cooling and heating energy needs uh, that will be demanded by that building over the course of a typical year. Uh, the data itself is drawn from meteorological observations that are usually um, drawn from the Bureau of Meteorology's um, sensor networks. Uh, and we focus on recent, uh, typically the last 30 years. Uh, of observations to characterise the climate for a given location. Um, 
uh, and then we we present the the typical uh, data sets in a range of different formats, including uh, TMY data, which is an internationally recognised standard format, uh, Energy Plus Weather, uh, which is a format developed for the Energy Plus tool that was uh, developed by the US Department of Energy, and the Australian Climate Data Bank, or ACDB format, which was developed by the CSIRO to support um, their residential modelling tools. Uh, so our role at Exemplary Energy is focused on transcribing the historic observations with a range of layers of quality assurance and backfilling. So for example, where, where we need to produce hourly data sets, uh, a range of historic observations are only available on three hourly or in some cases even daily uh, temporal resolutions. Uh, so in some cases we uh, have developed a range of um, processes for estimating the weather elements, uh, the full set of weather elements that coincide with the known observations that are already available. Um, so we produce representative coincident weather elements for specific locations and we, we currently service around about 250 locations across Australia uh, and most of our processes, as I said, are focused on recent years. So uh, we, we develop um, a 30-year time series history of weather as the starting point for most of the products that, that I'll be talking about. Um, and we, we then, uh, once we've got 30 years of hourly weather history for a location, uh, we analyse that to characterise uh, typical or extreme, et cetera, um, uh, climate characteristics for each location uh, according to a bunch of criteria that will depend on um, the application of interest. Uh, as I said, we disseminate those results in a range of different formats. Um, for different applications and software packages. Uh, and we, we also apply those um, uh, end results to our own archetype models to produce um, benchmark results or benchmarking results uh, that we call the Exemplary Weather and Energy Index. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, our clients take the weather and climate data sets and apply them to their various needs. So as I discussed earlier, the RMY, Representative Meteorological Year data sets, uh, are used in building simulation to evaluate designs and to demonstrate compliance with um, mandatory energy efficient provisions in the construction code. Um, and, and they use tools such as Design Builder, Energy Plus, or Transus uh, for HVAC energy. And there's a software package called Woofy, which is used for modeling building moisture control and management. Um, similar softwares, PBSYS or System Advisor model can use similar data sets uh, to model PV system performance. Um, so as I said, they. These tools can be used to uh, evaluate minimum compliance. Um, they, they are also used to develop and optimise models of the building to uh, improve the, um, uh, the performance of building designs. Um, separately, so that was representative meteorological year. That's your typical history or typical climate for a location. Uh, I think second on this list are um, real-time years, RTYs, and those data sets are usually the last 12 months of observations for the given location, and these data sets are used by facilities managers to evaluate performance during commissioning or following energy retrofits uh, or to uh, benchmark performance more generally. So, for example, in evaluating an energy retrofit, um, users seeking to verify the benefits and up of an upgrade need to estimate how much energy a building, an energy efficiency upgrade I should say, need to estimate how much energy a building would have used or how the building would have performed if the upgrade hadn't occurred. Um, and there's a, an internationally recognised certified measurement and verification protocol which um, uses the, that real-time year data set 
uh, to enable an analyst to evaluate the performance of the, uh, of the unmodified building or how the building would have performed under those observed conditions. And then we compare that to the actual or post-upgrade performance of the building, um, uh, which we can determine from the sensor network within the building. Uh, and the difference between the two is then attributed, attributed to the upgrade. Um, that certified measurement verification protocol is um, firstly value, valuable because it, uh, it allows a very objective measure of how much improvement um, the retrofit has provided. It's also recognised now in the state-based white certificate programs, the Victorian Energy Upgrades Program here in Victoria or the Energy Savers Scheme in New South Wales. And that enables the claiming of energy efficiency white certificates that can be the justification for deeper retrofits. Um, so yes, th those, those processes rely on real-time weather data applied to similar building models as those that are used in our design work. Um, either similar models or statistical models. Uh, performance benchmarking can also be used to monitor building energy use. Uh, and in, in these sorts of circumstances, uh, and I'll describe this in a moment, if we build some sort of a benchmark model that we can compare our own building to and track the performance of the two over time, then if you see any divergence in, uh, in that tracking, then that either indicates some change in the building activity or indicates that something is going wrong uh, in, in the building control system and uh, hopefully triggers some sort of a review of the performance and an un a better understanding uh, of what might be going wrong. Um, speaking, more, speaking generally about some of the challenges that we encounter in uh, producing these weather and climate data tools, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we come across is the timely sourcing and dissemination of weather data. So as I said earlier, most of the data is available from, most of the raw data is available from the Bureau of Meteorology, um, but from time to time uh, we do find that some of the weather elements either cease to be available in the given location or cease to be available at all, and that was something that we encountered a couple of years ago in an example that I'll, I'll give you shortly. Uh, secondly is validation of our archetype models um, and making sure that we're able to provide meaningful updates to the representative or typical meteorological year data. Um, defining extremes in the climate is uh, quite a complex process and I'll go through that in the next part of the presentation. And then sourcing new weather elements. So for example, precipitation was historically only uh, measured on a daily basis. Uh, and in applications where we need hourly data, uh, that creates its own challenges, and that's the third part of our presentation today. Um, so as I, as I noted a moment ago, one, of, one example of where we've struggled in recent years um, is obtaining uh, Bureau of Meteorology data on solar radiation. Um, for some complex internal reasons, the Bureau stopped um, disseminating uh, solar data in 2019 um, and have only recently recommenced uh, providing that data to the industry. We established a, a number of short-term workarounds with uh, some of our par key partners in a few of the capital cities across Australia and more recently we began purchasing the data from a commercial provider, Solcast. Um, Solcast, uh, I'll describe in a moment, I think it might be the next slide here. Um, Solcast take, the, ob the observations for solar irradiance, there are very few terrestrial observations um, made on solar in solar irradiance. Um, most the most useful observation is from what's called the Himawari satellite network and a, a number of geostationary satellites actually measure backscattering from the Earth's atmosphere at a range of different wavelengths. And that backscattering measurement can then be used to estimate how much solar is re reaching the ground uh, for thousands of locations across, across the country um, uh, by developing a statistical model, uh, essentially, uh, to relate the measuring of, measurement of backscattering to the global 
horizontal irradiance as well as uh, diffuse and direct irradiance. Um, now, ad, as I explained earlier, uh, as with our other data sources, um, the data that we're now receiving from Solcast is uh, being combined into our other products and disseminated into a range of formats for a whole lot of different applications. Uh, on to one of our next challenges, um, and that's uh, the range of different formats that are needed by our users uh, and some niche or technical, technical issues related to transposing between different formats. Um, unfortunately, different formats use uh, different timestamp conventions. Uh, so, for example, the ACDB format that's used by CSIRO in its Accurate software, which supports the National House Energy Rating Scheme, residential, um, in the solar data uses a convention of centering the solar observation because it's uh, an observation of integrated solar irradiance over a period of an hour. Uh, the timestamp is centred on the hour, or sorry, the observation uh, is for the hour centred on the timestamp. Whereas most other formats, including TMY2, TMY3, Energy Plus Weather, um, use a convention of uh, the timestamp in being an indication of solar irradiation integrated in the hour preceding the timestamp. Um, uh, for the sake of accuracy, it's not actually uh, viable to transpose between the two. And what we actually draw from uh, Solcast and now the Bureau's new um, service offering is uh, instantaneous readings at 10 minute intervals. Uh, and for each of those two formats, uh, we integrate the 10 minute readings either centered on the timestamp or in the hour preceding the timestamp. In looking to um, transpose between the two, we need to make all sorts of estimations around the nonlinearities of the, the solar profile. Uh, and things become very complex and most nonlinear around sunrise and sunset. Uh, when the sun is low in the sky, shading systems are, ob uh, are often not performing or not doing much to, to impact um, uh, the sunlight hitting buildings, for example, and can make significant uh, impacts on uh, the estimates of building performance. Uh, and that's, that's something that we're working with the CSIRO with at the moment because they've actually um, very kindly uh, started uh, disseminating uh, weather data in, or sorry, climate data in the EPW format. Uh, and we have some concerns that um, what they're disseminating is objectively wrong and it results in, um, uh, because of the time stamping issues, it, it results in building performance estimates that are around about 5% um, inaccurate or 5% uh, in error. Um, because what they've attempted to do is take the data sets that they were using for their Accurate tool, which used a different time stamping convention. Uh, so, so we're working with them and hoping to resolve those issues soon. Uh, aside from the issues with time stamping and most importantly for us, we're making arrangements to ensure uh, a placeholder for precipitation in the um, in the CSIRO's ACDB, Australian Climate Data Bank format, um, which I'll get to uh, the needs for that later in this presentation. Um, okay, mo moving on from there, let's discuss the next application of weather data in facilities management, and that's real-time data. So the first challenge in producing a real-time data set is in sourcing of the data, and I've already described some of the challenges of obtaining this data from the bomb. So suffice to say, we've now entered a commercial arrangement uh, and we're able to extend uh, these real-time data services to about 250 Australian locations uh, on demand, and we already have them available for uh, the eight capitals. Uh, stepping away from talking about the data and towards a discussion of, of what we see our users doing with it and what we do with it. So firstly, um, real-time 
real-time data can be applied to calibrated models which enable detailed consideration of control parameters and evaluation of uh, HVAC and building performance. So, for example, during building commissioning or during or, or detailed control optimization um, processes, uh, the real-time data becomes really important in understanding the specific relationship between that building, uh, between your building and the weather going on around it. Uh, calibrated modelling is um, a very technical and detailed process. Um, to just take the specifications of a building and try and build, try to build a model uh, doesn't quite work well enough to, uh, to really work out um, the subtle effects of small controls, uh, control changes. Uh, and so that's where a feedback process between uh, what's, what's observed happening in building performance and um, uh, tweaks to the model itself are really essential. Um, so we've, we've already discussed using RT uh, real-time data to evaluate energy retrofits uh, using techniques such as the Certified Measurement and, uh, Verification Protocol. Um, so the, and, and these are both calibrated modelling and the CMVP process, as I've said, are complex and expensive. Uh, facility managers looking to use real-time weather data for, for performance monitoring and benchmarking can apply much simpler methods. So for example, we can apply real-time data to an approximate model and compare the results to building energy use. And as I described earlier, any divergence is an indica indicator of something going wrong. Uh, we at Exemplary produce and freely share what we call the Exemplary Weather and Energy Index for this purpose. And I'll describe that here. Um, as I said earlier, this is a free monthly service that we provide to the industry through our blog and our uh, subscription mail out exemplary advances. Um, the, service, the service helps users understand how recent weather compares to the long term average. Uh, and to do this, we apply the real time weather data, the representative meteorological year data. Uh, as well as another product we call the ERSAT's Future Meteorological Years, and that's an estimate of, uh, of future climate going forward 30, 50 or 70 years, to um, three building archetypes in Energy Plus. So we've got an archetype for a single-storey supermarket, a three-storey uh, office building and a 10-storey high-rise office building. Um, including the HVAC systems and uh, developed using a technique that uh, ensures that they would comply under the current building code um, in each of the eight capitals, or at least approximate to approximate that. Um, the three main applications of, uh, of the results from this are for mon uh, monitoring for current owners and managers, uh, allowing prospective owners to predict the energy performance of a building on a square meterage basis, or for benchmarking in Green Star, Smart Score, Neighbours and, and other benchmarking type programs. Now this is what some of the results look like. Um, as I said, we disseminate the results via uh, our subscription mail out and on our blog. This infographic is one of the mechanisms we use to communicate how the most recent month of data, or what arbitrary period really, but we tend to look at it monthly. Uh, compares to the historical average. Uh, so, for example, here in Darwin, I'm not sure if you can read the small fonts at the back there, but um, uh, I think this was for June. The temperature in Darwin uh, was, on average, 1.7 degrees Celsius below uh, the historic average. Relative humidity was marginally higher and global horizontal irradiance marginally lower. Excuse me. So we have two components, a weather index and an energy index. The weather index evaluates the deviation of uh, monthly means of minimum, average and maximum uh, records for the dry bulb temperature, solar insulation, wind speeds and humidity compared to the long term average. Um, we apply our, the hourly observations uh, to the three building archetypes to get the series of um, uh, energy indices presented on the right here, 
which present variations in heating and cooling across the three building archetypes, as well as a PV system. Uh, so, as I said, we find applications of this in building or energy system modelling, uh, monitoring to help identify underperformance uh, and to compare ongoing performance against the benchmark to identify where thi well, when things are going wrong as opposed to where things are going wrong. Um, there is potential to dive into the results that we get from the models when we apply this data to gain further intel on the consumption profiles uh, and peak loads, etc. Um, we do a little bit of this in the narrative that we provide each month on our blog and we try to pluck out a few highlights, but um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to raise that here because there is plenty of opportunity to dive in more. We just try not to um, bore all of our readers every month with too much of the fine detail at every, at every step. Um, some of the things that we're working on at present uh, in the area of the EW, exemplary weather and energy index and the real-time data sources um, are developments uh, using or applications using other building archetypes. So as I said, we've got office buildings and supermarkets covered. Uh, we're considering applying this to uh, hotels, hospitals and a range of other commercial building types. Um, the, the archetypes are reasonably well defined. They're used by the Building Codes Board in the regulatory impact studies that inform the ongoing development of the National Construction Code. So they are to some extent standardised in Australia. Um, uh, it's really just a question of how much demand we see from those users. Um, a lot of uh, big hospital network facility managers uh, will often have a lot of their own uh, calibrated models or other very detailed services that they're providing. And we're really, we're really looking to service the smaller end of the market, the mid-sized commercial building operators and facility managers um, who don't have access to the high end and high cost and very detailed tools. Um, we're, we're always interested to, to, get fe to take feedback on our presentation of the results and the extraction of insights uh, and to take thoughts from our readers on other opportunities that are available uh, to uh, develop further intel from the data that we have available. Uh, so we always welcome the insights of the broader community uh, and if you do see uh, other opportunities then I'd welcome your thoughts and questions. So that, that now brings us to the end of the first part of the presentation, the real-time year data sources.